Well, good morning and welcome to Calvary Baptist Church. It's so great to see you. It's so great to be here with you. Today is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Would you stand with us and let's lift a shout of praise to our great God today. He is worthy of all praise, all honor, and all glory. So let's give him that today. Let's sing this out. I'm casting my fears aside. I'm leaving my past behind. I'm setting my heart. anxious for nothing, but in everything, pray. Pray about everything. I hope that's who we are and what we're doing. God bless you. So good to see you all here this morning. Welcome to you. Welcome to those of you who are online with us as well. If you're a guest with us today, a special welcome to you. Please take a moment. You'll find a card right beside you. Fill that out. Drop it by our office on the way out so we can connect with you. If you're online with us and want to connect, you can do that at guest at calvary.on.ca. 
couple of announcements to highlight. Uh, ladies, you are having a worship service event that's coming up on Saturday, January 29th. I hope that you've signed up. If you haven't yet, sign up online or at the office. And also, we have an upcoming How to Belong class, uh, February 3rd. If you have never had an opportunity to get together with us at our How to Belong uh, class, to get to know a little bit more about our ministry here, um, you can do that February 3rd. Sign up as well at the office, or I think you can do that online as well, and we'd love to have you join with us. And then um, one other thing, and this has gone out as an email reminder to you, but you might not, not have seen it. Uh, one of our ministry associates, Matthew Jones, has been on our pastoral training track for quite some time, and uh, we're believing that he's ready to be um, affirmed as an elder here at Calvary Baptist Church. But the final stage is to put that out to the congregation and, and seek your confirmation and affirmation and your feedback. Uh, so you have till February 6th to do that, so please do do so. Speak to one of the pastors and let us know um, what you've seen in, in Matthew's life, that we can go forward with that as well in his. So, so I trust that you're here to lift up your voices and, ser and serve the Lord with praise and adoration. Let's sing and let's, uh, let's meet with our God today, shall we? Amen. Our mission here at Calvary Baptist Church is to enable people to become fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. And one of the exciting privileges we have is to help people to obey Christ's command to be baptized. And so this morning, it's my honor to be able to baptize a mom and her son. And so I'm going to invite Lucas Elliott to join me in the baptism tank. Hello, my name is Lucas, I am 12 years old. I've always been taught about the importance of obeying God's commands and following Jesus, but only recently did I receive Jesus as my personal savior and became saved. Some people believe Jesus is not the son of God, but I know the truth. The only way to move on and be whole in life is to accept Jesus as <laughs> to accept the sacrifice they made. It's the most sad but beautiful thing in history. As a result, we'll have life after death and even one day be able to walk with Jesus. I definitely know how amazing that will be. My favorite Bible verse is Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. This is a truth and I pray that many may come to know it. Amen. Lucas was so nervous, and I said, whenever you're going to obey the commands of Christ, and that might not be easy, but he'll give you the strength to do that. Amen? Amen? So you got through it, Lucas. I have two questions for you. Have you received Jesus as your Savior? Yes. And is it your intention to serve him through the help of the Holy Spirit and obey his commands for the rest of your life as your Lord? Yes. Then, Lucas, based on your confession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And now invite his mom, Jeanette, to come into the baptism tank. Hello, my name is Jeanette Cormier, and I'm here today to publicly proclaim that I've received Jesus Christ as my Savior, and I want to fulfill the Lord's command of being baptized. I was raised by two loving parents to know and fear God, and to remember the mercy God showed us through the sacrifice of his son. Throughout my life, I've been very blessed to have been able to learn more about God and His Word through Christian family and friends. However, it wasn't until I had children of my own and saw God working in my life that I truly accepted Christ as my Savior. It opened up to a real relationship with Him. Lord, I'm not worthy. Thank you for helping me to willingly accept your gift of salvation, and I thank you for allowing me to be here today to see my son baptized. My favorite Bible verse is Romans 8:18. 8, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Janet, I have two questions for you. Have you received Jesus as your Savior? Yes. And is it your intention through the help of the Holy Spirit to serve him as the Lord of your life for the rest of your life? Yes. 
Then Jeanette, based on your confession of faith, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's thank God for his transforming work in our lives. Father, thank you so much for the public, visible working of your grace and mercy in Jeanette and Lucas's life. Continue to help them to grow as followers of you. Help us as a congregation to walk alongside them. And Lord, we just want to give you all the credit and all the glory for what we have just witnessed this morning because it's because of your grace, Father, and through the work of your Son that this was able to happen today. We love you, and now we're going to worship you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, what a rich reminder that our God is doing work in our midst. Amen, church. Would you stand with us? Let's continue praising our great God, thanking Him for who He is, that He is a holy, worthy, awesome God, the great I Am. Let's sing to Him now.
no one, no one like our God. And there was power, there was might, and there was strength in his name, the name of Jesus. Let's continue praising that name, giving him all the glory and honor that he deserves. Let's sing to him now. Thank you. 
Jesus be exalted higher and higher. It's been good to sing. You may be seated. Good morning, Calvary family. Good morning. As we go to prayer this morning, let us uh, continue to remember Jeff and Karen Clemens with the passing of Jeff's mom, Pat. Let's pray together. Father, we love you and we just thank you for this moment that we can have today with you. As we enter into worship of the most amazing king who cares deeply for the church, who cares deeply for us. God, this Sunday morning is an opportunity for us to draw close to you as you draw close to us. So God, just thank you for this moment that we've had already this morning to be able to sing these beautiful words to you, knowing they are true knowing that you're with us. We thank you that all authority in heaven and earth has been given to Jesus. And because of his great sacrifice, his perfect life and his sacrificial death, we can enter into prayer with you. And these moments matter. We can bring our cares to you. We can bring our struggles to you. We can bring our hopes and we can stand in confidence with thanksgiving. We present these things to you knowing that you care, knowing that you'll act, knowing that you have the best interest of your church. This morning, God, we pray for Jeff and Karen, uh, as you've called home Jeff's mom. We just pray for the comfort and peace that passes all understanding to guard that family at this time. As they think about their, as he thinks about his mom's life and, and how she has loved you, Lord, she is now home safe with you. And we know that the passing, when people in our lives pass, it's hard for us, but we rejoice because we do not grieve like those outside of faith, but it still hurts, and it's still hard. So, God, I pray for peace. And, Father, you know the cares and the concerns of every person in our church. Nothing is a surprise to you. So, Lord, we ask that you would give the correct portion of the things needed for those who are struggling, those who may be sick, those who are battling different things in their lives. Lord, I pray that you would just help them. And by name, I pray this morning for Len and Mike, and Ray and Kelly and Clarence and Diane and Jen and Karen and Hugh and Mark and Evelyn and little Henry. God, you know exactly what is needed and we pray and ask that you would help. We're, no, we're learning and understanding that you work in mysterious ways. Your ways are not our ways. And sometimes we pray and we pray and we seek these things and you answer in different ways. And I pray, God, for those who are seeking you this morning, asking you for various things, uh, that you would help them to rest solely in you, that you have the great plans and you have the, you have the understanding that we may not understand, um, but you always work for the best of your church and, and to the glory of your name. Uh, so help us to be patient in you as you work these things out in our life. God, we wanna pray for... Uh, Ruth Desjardins today, as she represents our shut-ins, I pray that you would help her. I pray that you would care for her. I pray that she would know and understand uh, that her church loves her and caring for her. And for those who can't make it out to church this morning, uh, God, we would want them to be with us. We, we want people to come and, and join in in the fellowship, and we, but we know that there are certain circumstances that... Uh, don't allow for that. So God, uh, we pray for those who can't make it in today. And we pray for our global partners and our mission agent agency this week, Mark and Ruth Diane, Dana from NCEM and the Bible Club Movement as our mission agency. God, we just present them to you and we just ask that you would bless them this week as they work for you, set up divine appointments, help the gospel go forward and build your church. And this morning, God, I pray for Pastor Rick. As he opens up your word, I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit that we would draw in that we would learn, that we would trust you as you work things out for your namesake and for your glory. We ask these things in your name we pray. Amen. Well, would you stand with us again and, uh, and let's put aside the things that so easily distract us. Let's turn our eyes. Let's fix our heart on Jesus, the author, the perfecter, the finisher of our faith. Let's sing to him now. Oh, so my soul, are you weary in trouble? No night so dark that our eyes cannot see. There is light so bright as we look to our Savior. 
so good it is so important for us together as a family to ascribe worth to our great god amen you can be seated well jesus has made a bold promise to us that we can have answered prayer Now, I know if you've been a Christian for any time at all, it probably seems like, yeah, I know that, that's obvious, and maybe that's a problem. We've taken it too much for granted. Have we thought at all about the grandness of this promise? That we, creatures, can actually call out to our Heavenly Father, the creator of the universe, and make our requests known to him, ask him to answer our prayers. And our God is a prayer-answering God. 
It's an amazing thing. In fact, Jesus has made some really, really bold promises. Out of the wilderness of heavenly silence and into the promise of answered prayer. How many are interested in that? I would think so. Jesus said in Mark eleven twenty four, Therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them, and they will be granted you. In John 15, 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. 1 John 5, 15, and if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which, have, which we have asked from him. These are, these are bold statements. How is your prayer life? How are the answers flowing from your prayer life? Because what we're talking about is the promise of answered prayer. If we're honest, we may be among those who are disillusioned about prayer or disappointed with God because he hasn't answered our prayers or we've been praying for something over and over again and there is silence from heaven. And maybe some of us have mostly quit praying or are maybe even angry at God because he hasn't answered something. Is it that we should just keep praying with persistence and we haven't done that? We, we haven't looked at our little bracelet that says push, pray until something happens. Does that work? We're going to find out today that Jesus qualifies prayer that is answered by God. Not just everything we throw heavenward is answered. You say, oh, well, wait a minute. I've always been told that our prayers are answered. It's either yes, no, or wait. Did I hear wait? What about... A fourth alternative, that God isn't hearing your prayer at all. Of the majority of disciplines that engage Christians, perhaps prayer, there's no, perhaps there's no other discipline that's as grossly misrepresented, over-exaggerated in scope or undervalued as prayer. The quest for the miraculous and the mysterious nature of prayer is mostly exercises in totally missing the point. We hear what we want to hear. We read what we want to read. But we're not careful enough to pay attention to the Lord. And by the way, of note, I'm going to say this. I've said this many, many times. There's no power in prayer. Calvary people stop using that phrase. It's not biblical. There's no power in prayer. Pagans pray. Irreligious people pray. Are their prayers answered? Is there power in their prayers? Prayer is an activity, but unless it's empowered by God, it has no effect whatsoever. And unless our prayers come into alignment with what Jesus has actually promised and taught us, they also have no value. So my mission today with you is to take one section of Scripture, John chapter 14, one promise that Jesus has made about prayer, which ties together with a number of other ones, and we will tie them together my mission is to show you what Jesus has actually promised. Because that's what matters. What did Jesus actually promise us? 
Jesus has told us what prayers get answered. Are you interested? John chapter 14. Because remember when we, our, our goal in looking at promises is to always put them in context. Okay, they don't stand out there alone. These are promises that have been made in the, in the context of, of, of greater teaching. More expansive teaching. So John 14 helps us. By the way, most of you say, well, that's a, isn't this a funeral uh, text? I mean, I have, I have recited this first part of this chapter more times than I can, can count at the graveside of individuals. It's a great text for a graveside service, but it's not really, it's, it's not really intended for that. This was a very intentional moment where Jesus had his disciples and was telling them about the future. Notice what it says. This context is very important in, in what Jesus promised to them and why he promised it and why he promises it to us. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. Why were their hearts troubled? Well, he goes on. In my father's house are many rooms. If, I were not, if it were not so, I would have told you, I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Wait a minute. Jesus is going somewhere? He's going away? He's letting his disciples in on the fact that he's leaving. That's why their hearts were troubled. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And then this great famous verse, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know, me. You do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will obey what I command, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. We'll leave it right there. This is the word of God. Our Father, here we are with Bibles open this morning. Your people hungry for your word, for your teaching. What do you have for us, Lord? We need to know about prayer is vital to our lives. We need, we need to know how to pray. We need to know how to receive answers to prayer, oh God. And here we find you have delivered to us everything we need to understand the answers to those questions. So I pray this morning, Father, that we will be lasered in on the truth, that we will look very carefully this preconceived ideas that we have, have gathered along the way that are in contrast to what you have said here, then I pray, God, that we will, re we will allow those to be released and to receive and welcome your truth. I pray, O oh God, that your people here and in the hearing of this word will become more effective in our prayer lives, that we may pray the way the Lord wants us to pray, 
that we might enjoy the benefits of this amazing offer to us, this amazing promise, the promise of answered prayer. People to God the creator who will answer our prayers. Lord, it's another of the astonishing things of your grace to us that uh, we must not miss out on. And I pray that we won't. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Any study of Jesus' life at all among us points out to us how vital prayer was to Jesus. He prayed all the time. And his prayers were answered. So he knows something about answered prayer. He can help us. He can teach us. He didn't waste a lot of energy doing things that God didn't, the Father didn't want him to do. Like we do. He didn't ask for a bunch of things that the Father had no intention of giving to him. Like we do. He was never frustrated about his prayer life, never frustrated with the Father, never angry with the Father, because his prayer life was about answered prayer. And now he's passing it along to us. That's what this is all about. The disciples in context here are needing to be comforted because Jesus is leaving. He's going to be crucified, he's going to be buried He's going to be entombed. He's going to be raised again. And he's going to be ascended to heaven. And he's not going to be with them anymore. And it's troubling to them. And he's comforting them in this. Because in their mind, it's like, we just got started on this mission. It's like three years old. We, we left everything. We left our careers. I had a big, the, the Zebedee brothers, they had a, a, an interesting fishing gig going that was successful. And you're leaving. <laughs> you, you know, have you ever had someone in your life who gets you all stirred up about something you get involved with and everything like, like by the way, oh, I'm, I'm cutting out. I'm going to do something different. What? I left it, I left it all. Like I, I divested myself of everything. So they are interested in what's, what's the, what's, the next steps here and Jesus is telling them don't be discouraged don't be troubled in your heart I'm going to the father but there's a few things that I'm promising to you I'm I'm promising you that the work that we have started is going to continue that the work and mission of Jesus is being handed off to you and there's three promises he makes to them to make sure that the work is, is, is able to continue. And the one is, he said that you're going to do greater works than even I've done. Now, you know, I, I want to be careful not to launch myself into the explanation of this too far because it's a whole sermon or series of sermons. I'll give you a quick idea of what I think is going on here. I think, I think Jesus is saying, guys, you need to get this wrapped around your mind. You're going to do greater things by ungreat people, okay? It's no surprise of what I was able to do. I am the son of God, a very God, okay? But you're going to do great things. You, ungreat guys, ungreat people are going to do great things, and, and I don't think he's talking about in degree, because who can outdo God? I think he's talking about scope. I think he's talking about kind. I, I think Harry Ironside is very helpful here in his explanation when he says, pay attention to the context. What was the context? The context is revealing the Father. That's what Jesus is saying. I came to reveal the Father. Philip, you know, don't you get it? To see me is to see the Father. That, that's my job. The mission of Jesus was to reveal the Father, to reveal God. And the mission simply put forward to us is to continue the mission of revealing Almighty God to our world. 
And the great thing is the scope with which you're going to do it. Jesus, locked into a human body, one person on earth, can't get around very far. But to launch the church of Jesus Christ globally, now that's something. And with unworthy servants, ungreat people, not divine people, this is a great thing. And, and all we have to do is look at history for a few moments and realize that within 300 years, the Ro pagan Roman temples be became antique roadshows. Christianity had, had, had infused itself into the Roman world. This is a great, great thing. So he makes that promise to them. He also makes the promise of answered prayer. That's what verse 13 and 14 are about. By the way, he says to them, we're not going to stop talking. I'm going to heaven, but you and I, we're all going to keep talking. We're, we're all going to be in communication and conversation. And you're going to talk to me, and I'm going to give you whatever you ask for. Anything you ask me, I'm going to give you. That's what he says to them. Well, with some qualifiers. We like to hear what we want to hear. And the third thing he talks about is the indwelling, the, the, another counselor, the indwelling Holy Spirit. God is going to move into your lives. You're going to have an intimate relationship with Almighty God from the inside. Now that's three powerful promises. That to encourage the disciples, to encourage the church, you guys, he said, you can do this. You can continue the work and mission of, that, that I have started and I'm going to make sure you do greater stuff. Answered prayer. The power of God resident in you to carry this out. Now that's the context. As D.A. Carson says about the context, fruitful conduct is to be the product of their prayers. Well, that's what Jesus says in John 15, 8. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit. And so prove to be my disciples. Jesus says, I'm going to do this through you. So what, what is the exact promise that we're looking at this morning? Verse 14 of chapter 14. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Okay, let me think about this for a moment. Hmm. Please, Lord, have someone deliver me an envelope this afternoon that completely takes care of my mortgage. Anybody interested in that prayer? <laughs> Being all right prayer. Think you're gonna get that one answered? I see a lot of heads nodding no. Oh ye of little faith. <laughs> I'll report back next week. No, I, I mean, I think that's what we hear when we, when we hear Jesus say, you may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. What does this anything mean? Are there any qualifiers here? Does anything mean anything? Does it mean whatever? You ready to answer the question? I want to share with you, uh, with the time that we have, a theological truth sandwich, I'm going to call it, on the word anything here, an answered prayer. Because in, this, uh, in between uh, the surrounding verses, verses 12 and 13 and verse 15, 14 is embedded as the sand, you've got the, the, the external and then inside the sandwich of verse 14, there are four obvious qualifiers to help us to understand what anything or whatever means. Okay, you ready? First is found in verse 12. Here's how we move out of the wilderness of heavenly silence into the promise of answered prayer. Four qualifiers to your prayers. One. Verse 12. Notice what it says. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me Anyone who has faith in me. The promise of answered prayer is for believers only. Is for people 
In fact, we, we studied the word believe last week, faith, pistao, faithine. In fact, uh, the New American Standard translates what Jesus said here as anyone who believes in me, anyone who, who believes in me will. Because that's the word, it believes. It's, it's literally saying anyone who's faithing in me, anyone who's trusting in me, anyone who is, belongs to me. That's the context here. And, and the prayer is direct, the prayers are to anyone, are, are not to anyone, but to the triune God alone. Anyone who has faith or is believing in me. The triune God. You can't an- ask for prayers in any other name. Jesus alone. The triune God alone. People say, can you pray to the Father? Yes. Can you pray to the Son? Yes. Can you pray to the Holy Spirit? Yes. In Jesus' name. Anyone has faith in me. And it's not about more faith. In fact, Jesus already settled that. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can tell that mountain, go and cast yourself in the sea, and it will. But it's not the faith in our faith. Do you see what Jesus said? Faith in me. Okay? It's about faith in Jesus. It's not more faith. It's properly directed faith. Properly informed faith. So it's really, in terms of the issue of prayer, is do you have saving faith? Do you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ? You can't get out of the starting gate in prayer being answered unless you belong to Jesus. Now some of you will say, wait a second, um, does Jesus never answer prayers for someone outside of faith in Christ? No, no, he he does occasionally. He will answer prayer. History tells us he, he has, and the future will demonstrate that he does. But the vast majority, the, virtually the, the way that theology of this is, is laid out is Jesus answers the prayers of those who belong to him. And the prayers that he answers of those who don't belong to him are for his purposes. Perhaps the prayer of a sinner asking the Lord to save him. That prayer has to happen before salvation happens. So you see God at work in people's lives outside of himself who he's bringing to himself. So saving faith. And why? Because it is Jesus who gets your prayers answered. We don't answer our own prayers. We have to rely on Jesus answering our prayers. That takes us to the second qualification here. You'll notice that it says in in verse 13... And I will do whatever you ask in my name. In my name. That's uh, mediator language, right? Asking Jesus. That's that's the same kind of language that comes out of 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. This is mediator language that we're talking about here. We are asked to pray in the name of Jesus. Now look at All authority has been given to Jesus, yes? He's told us that. Matthew 28. And you'll notice in the text here in verse 13 that he says, I will do whatever you ask. And at the end of verse 14, and I will do it. Jesus is making very, very bold declarations here of whatever you ask, I will do it. Whatever, anything, I will do it. He's teaching us here how to always be heard. And always have our prayers answered so that Jesus will actually do it. Now, some people have tried to soft pedal this, this uh, the, 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 you know, the substance of what Jesus is promising here. To reduce expectations, say, well, Jesus doesn't really mean whatever or anything. To kind of insulate us from disappointment. Others have stated way too forcefully, yeah, 
yeah, you can name anything you want. You can claim anything you want. That's what he means here. So at tension is what does he really, I believe that Jesus actually means what he says. He is saying I will do anything. He's saying I'll do whatever you ask. Providing you're asking in my name. Providing you're asking from a context of faith in me. Now see, here's, the, here's what, what often we do. There's something in our lives that's really troubling to us. And we allow, um, we allow unworthy thoughts to come into our heart and our mind. We start to think that, wait a second, I, I've been a Christian for 40 years or 30 years or whatever. I've been serving the Lord. Lord, I've been teaching in Sunday school for 25 years. I, I've, been, I've been, you know, out in the cold parking lot every winter for 15 years parking cars. And we get in, into our heart the thinking that we have kind of a service contract going on with God. And, and Lord, you know, I'm, I'm asking you for this one thing. I've been doing all this for you. You, you owe me. Maybe we, maybe we stop short of saying that because we, we're not sure that's the right way to ask. But Lord, surely I'm, surely you could throw me a bone on this one. After all that I've done for you. You know the problem with that? There's a number of problems with that. But not the least of which is that means we would be praying in our name. You see, Lord, what I'm bringing to you is my credentials. I'm bringing to you my service record. I'm bringing to you my sacrifices. In turn, we have a contract. You answer prayer. Jesus is saying it doesn't work that way. And there is a reason it doesn't work that way because we don't, God doesn't owe us anything. See? See? If we understand the nature and character of our relationship with God, it's by grace we have been brought into a relationship with God. You know what grace is? Grace is undeserved favor. Not because of anything you did. It's not, Jesus didn't save you because you were going to be an amazing contributor to the church of Jesus Christ. It's not it at all. He didn't save you because of, you were going to offer him a great service record. He saved you by his grace for no reason other than his love for you, not because you deserved it. You certainly couldn't merit it, and you can't merit answered prayer. There's only one person who can merit answered prayer on your behalf and my behalf, and that's Jesus. Jesus is the only one who has a claim on the Heavenly Father on our behalf. He actually has the right to go before the Father and mediate our prayers and ask the Father on our behalf. That's why Jesus says, I will do what you ask in my name. It has to be done in my name. That's why we say, for Jesus' sake, at the end of our prayers mostly, for Jesus' sake. Why should, why should this prayer be answered? For my sake? No. None of us say, you know, you're going to hear me up here praying, Lord, please give us, a, a, you know, a great resources this year for Rick's sake. Are you kidding me? But that's what we think in our hearts sometimes. No. In for Jesus' sake. He's the only one who has a claim to any of this. See, that's why James could write in James chapter 4, 2, and 3, you have not because you ask not. And, and, and here's the problem. When you ask, you ask for wrong things so that you can spend them on your own selfish desires. Those aren't prayers in Jesus' name. Jesus isn't going to give you the selfish desires. 
Furthermore, we need to understand that, man, you, you can't think that you can go and, and pray in Jesus' name at the same time as you're treating your wife like garbage. 1 Peter 3, 7. It just doesn't work that way. Young ladies, you, you can't think that you can go and pray in Jesus' name and harbor in your heart bitterness towards someone, unforgiveness towards someone, and think that, that you can now lay out a prayer in Jesus' name and he's going to answer that prayer because it's not in Jesus' name. You might be th- saying this morning, I thought prayer was for me. <laughs> I thought it was for me. That takes us to our third qualification. Notice in verse 13, and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that, here's the purpose of why he would answer your prayer, so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. Wow. Do you see here that Jesus' qualifier of the purpose of his own mission on earth and the continuation of his mission is so that the Father would be glorified by how we reveal the truth of God to our world. Which means prayers that he will answer must be related to God getting glory. You see this? Because we are praying to Jesus, and Jesus' purpose is to bring glory to the Father. So if we're not praying in such a way as the answer to our prayer will enable Jesus to bring glory to the Father, he's not going to answer that prayer. Jesus is only willing to represent prayers that enable him through you to bring glory to God. That the answer to your prayer will result in showing how great God is. That others will be attracted to him too. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, let your light so shine that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Let your representation of God on earth reveal the greatness of God who is in heaven. That's prayers that God will answer. You're entrusted by Jesus to continue his work and mission, right? That's what we see in the context. That's the point. That's the context here. That's what we are. Listen, we can boil this all down. Your life, you know, you have a career, you got this going, that going, whatever you got going. But if you're a child of God, it boils down to this. Everything about you that you do and are is continuing the work and mission of Jesus. That's it. That, that's, that's where the good and faithful servant thing comes in when you stand before Christ someday. How did you advance the work and mission of Jesus wherever he placed you? In your home, mothers with your children. Or ladies in the workplace, wherever you are. Or men in, in the construction site. Or wherever God has put you. How did you advance the work and mission of Jesus to the glory of God. That's what Jesus is saying. Those are the prayers I'm going to answer, he says. I'm going to answer the prayers that are related to that. So prayer is not first to get something from God, but that God would get something from you in his answer to your prayer. By answering your prayer, will God be glorified. That's why the Apostle Paul, you know, in 2 Corinthians Chapter 12, verse 7 through 10. The Apostle Paul talks about the fact that so that he wouldn't get too proud, God had allowed a thorn, something painful in his life. And it says there in the text, 
that he prayed three times. Three times. Now, do you think Paul said to Jesus, hey, you know, I've been dragging my carcass all over the Asia Minor, sharing the gospel with people, putting my life at risk. You owe me. Anybody think the Apostle Paul prayed that way? That's good. I don't think he did. And God answered, but not the way he wanted. Why? He said to, he said to Paul, listen, in your weakness, I am shown to be strong. The way I am leaving you with this pain is revealing to people my incredible power. So, beloved, when we pray and ask God for things, circumstances, that situations that are very painful to us, and we don't, we're wondering, we pray over and over, God, remove this or take this away. I need this gone. And sometimes he doesn't. And the reason he won't is because we, his people, know that we are called to pray for the glory of God, not for our comfort, not for the change of our situation, not for our rescue, but for the glory of God. And he will answer that prayer. Prayers must, you know, and I, this, is the tough, this is the toughest part of the Christian life. We have to be okay with our prayer life totally turned over to the glory of God outcomes. That's what it means to have a vital prayer life with God. There's one final thing. There's one final qualification. In John 15, 7, Jesus says, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish. Do you see in verse 15, Jesus completes his thought. You know, you've probably got a kind of an intrusive break in the conversation that Jesus was having by the interpreters and, and, and scholars and all who put a title, Jesus promises the Holy Spirit. Ah, you know, great. But unfortunately, it interrupts a conversation. The conversation continues to qualify answered prayer. If you obey what I command, you demonstrate your love for me. You know, when Jesus promised the Holy Spirit to come and live in our lives, the point of that is that the atmosphere of the temple now, where God resides, would be characterized by love, love of God for us and love of us for God. That's the context of the, uh, of the, the atmosphere of the temple. The Jesus is saying answered prayer grows out of the richness of a temple whose atmosphere is about loving me and loving me is about obeying my commands. Loving me is, is about discipling your family and being, being a disciple maker at your workplace and a disciple maker on your street and a disciple maker in the highways and byways. It's, it, it's about being baptized because that's what I've commanded you to do. It, it's, about, it's about obeying whatsoever things I've commanded you. This is the context and atmosphere with which you will have answered prayer. There's a, a resting moment that I uncovered, uncovered this week in uh, uh, my uh, quiet time with God, which is, was not related or it wasn't intended to be related to the text, but it jumped out at me in Zechariah. 
in chapter 7, then, it came about that just as he, the Lord of hosts, called and they would not listen, so they called and I would not listen, says the Lord of hosts. If, you're, if you don't love me enough to listen to my commands that I've given to you, I'm not going to listen to your prayers because they won't be shaped according to my will. They won't be shaped according, they won't be shaped in my name for my sake. They won't be shaped in a way that glorifies God. Prayers must align with the will and purpose of Christ in his word by people who are living in line with the will and purposes of Christ. You shouldn't expect God things from God if you're holding out on him. As, as James Boyce writes, Christ-like conduct convinces us that God can trust us with his blessings. When I know I'm vitally into the word of God and living according to the word of God, I have great confidence in praying because I know that God can entrust me with his blessings. So let's wrap this up with some quick application, okay? Let's summarize what we've learned here. This is the theology of answered prayer. What's the application for all of us? You know, how does our prayer life, how does your prayer life make you different than a lost person? It should. I mean, the basis of this theology, your prayer life should be quite different. Your life should be quite different. You shouldn't be panicking. We should be at peace. Be anxious for nothing. Pray about everything. Our world is in panic mode. Literally in panic mode. And some of God's people are swept into this panic. I'm not panicking. Why, are you, why would you be panicking? If God is for us, who or what can be against us? In, in what way are you or me uh, handling disappointment or deprivation differently from the world? What about when God doesn't give you what you ask him for or doesn't remove that thing that's really troubling you? Are, are you going to whine and complain and get angry at God and give up on him and be disappointed in him like they would be? Do your prayers reflect a radically different purpose for your life than the desires of people who don't know God? What do you ask for? I'm, I'm withdrawing my mortgage request how likely are you to pray for the purposes of prayer that we've learned today praying for yourself or for the glory of God so here it is prayer your prayer content checklist should look like this The goal of your prayer life and my prayer life should first be to pursue the will of God. Lord, may my life pursue the will of God. Remember Jesus prayed, not my will, but yours be done. Matthew 26, 39. 1 John 5, 14. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. That's how prayer is heard. Praying according to God's will. Secondly, to be transformed into the likeness of Christ. This is the will of God, Paul writes to the Thessalonians. Your sanctification. Your prayer life should be about your holiness. Lord God, please make me more, a more usable vessel for the work and mission of Jesus Christ. That's a prayer that will be answered. Third, to continue the work and mission of Jesus. That's what Jesus is saying. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. If we ask Jesus to enable us to do the work and mission of Jesus Christ, he will answer that prayer. And finally, to bring glory to God in whatever he asks of me so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. 
You know, uh, the toughest prayer of all for us, I think, is probably right here. Lord, may my situation and my circumstances as determined and permitted by you be used to showcase the excellence of the glory of God through your grace to me. That's praying prayers that will be answered. Prayer is calling on Christ to do his work in and through me. That's what it is. Lord God, I thank you for your word to us. It is powerful. It is helpful. It is life to us. It is food to us, food to our soul. Oh God, you have, you have not left us uninstructed in the matter of answered prayer. You have made it abundantly clear how prayer is answered. It's up to us, Lord, to respond in obedience to your word to us by how we pray and how we can enjoy the blessings of what you really meant when you said whatever, anything. You meant it. Whatever, anything, in my name, for my mission, for my people, for the glory of God, it's yours. Lord, may we start praying prayers that Jesus says, that's yours. I'm giving you that. For Jesus' sake, I pray. Amen. Well, would you stand with us again and let's, uh, let's respond in singing to our great God today.
You know, go ahead and sit down for a moment. I just want to make sure that we leave understanding what Jesus has really taught us here today because there is so much abuse of this stuff. A lot of people take this teaching of Jesus, I will do whatever, I'll, anything you ask. I'll, and they just take it, they take it into, a, into a carnival of Protestant indulgences. If you pay enough, God will give you all of this. That's, that, that's just distressing and disturbing. Others are thinking, you know, God overpromised and underdelivered because I'm not getting my prayers answered. No, this is, listen, Jesus has made it abundantly clear how he answers prayer and what should shape our prayers. Jesus has asked me for my mission, the work that I began to be continued through you. Ask me for that. And ask me based on the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit in your life, not through your strength, but the infinite power of God to deliver on your prayer. Ask me from the context of obedience to the commands of Christ. Ask me from your passion in the word of God. And then ask me for all of that so that it will glorify God the Father. Mission, power, command, glory. And I will give you anything, whatever you ask, in my name. So God bless you. Have a, a great week. Serve the Lord with all of your hearts. Love him with all of your mind, soul, body, and strength. God bless. Have a great day.